Well, it's my final uh, responsibility here and, and real honor to introduce our first uh, speaker. Uh, Kathleen Merrigan uh, just stepped down as Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, the number two position at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, just a few days ago, having served with distinction for over four years. Uh, and alongside uh, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack uh, in the Obama administration. Uh, Kathleen's got uh, a long resume of uh, government service, uh, public service, as well as work in the academic sector. Uh, and in the Clinton administration from 1999 to 2001, uh, Kathleen uh, was appointed by President Clinton as administrator for USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service, uh, an organization at USDA that is very much attuned to the issues around the use of crop protection products uh, and the need to improve productivity, particularly of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables that are so essential for an ever-improving, healthful diet for Americans. Uh, Kathleen also served for six years as a senior staff member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, working directly for Senator Patrick Leahy, including during the time that uh, Pat was chairman of the Senate Ag Committee. In 2009, uh, Kathleen became the first woman to chair the Ministerial Conference for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and 2010 was selected as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People on the Planet. As Deputy Secretary, Kathleen was responsible for overseeing the entirety of USDA's programs and budget, working directly with Secretary Vilsack. She managed uh, carefully the uh, Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food uh, initiative and is a strong supporter of local, sustainable agricultural systems. Kathleen, it's a delight to welcome you to the podium and uh, invite you to deliver your opening remarks here. Join me in welcoming Kathleen Merrigan. everybody. So many good friends in the audience. I've been spending the last two weeks hiding out in my home, attacking the weeds in my yard. It's kind of good to get back in some work clothes and in town. Um, and my kids are very grateful that I'm left. My teenage daughter, I keep telling her we're going to spend more and more time together. And she grimaces, trying to be a good daughter. I'm torturing her. So here's my challenge, as I understand it, from the conference organizers, and I do appreciate the invitation to speak today. Farm bills are, as we say in Massachusetts, wicked important. Wicked important. And obviously, the Senate is going to resume debate this morning. Uh, I see Jerry Hagstrom's here. I'm being bombarded by the Hagstrom report because he's giving me the up-to-date uh, developments all the time. And, uh, I'm sure there are people here in the room who know more about what's going on in the farm bill than I do, because two weeks gardening at your home, that's two weeks you're out of the game. So I'm pleased that my challenge today is to talk about non-farm bill issues that we should all be thinking about. What are some of the potentially transformative movements on the horizon, non-farm bill? I picked 10. Um, it's not an all-inclusive list. Uh, that was sort of what I thought fit the time span that I was allotted. And uh, I'm not going to present them in any particular order. So the first is immigration reform. When I came to my job as deputy secretary, it was on my short list of priorities for my job as deputy. And certainly, Tom Vilsack and I spent a lot of time talking about ag jobs and the importance of immigration reform to the uh, survival of American agriculture as we know it. Now, at a certain point, it became clear that we were not going to have ag go alone, that we were going to go for the whole enchilada, fine. Um, and maybe we're on the cusp of that, and how exciting. The immigration bill was uh, passed out of committee uh, yesterday. Um, we certainly hope that it, it succeeds. I heard so much about the need for immigration reform as I traveled the country over the past four years from sitting down with the California Farm Bureau on one coast all the way to my home state of Massachusetts where Congressman Jim McGovern put me on a flatbed with a bunch of farmers in a very hot, sunny day. And we traveled way far from the farmhouse and they had a 
a little chew session on the need for immigration reform, and there was nowhere to escape. So um, I really did hear a lot about it. It needs to happen. The last cabinet meeting I attended was with the president talking about immigration reform, so I know it's a very big priority. I did mention to um, his, his communications team that I'm surprised that there's not more talk about food safety and food costs in this current debate. But anyhow, it's, it's really important, um, and it is right on the heels of the Farm Bill debate, and there's some speculation that you know, we're going to continue in the Farm Bill deliberations as people start setting up uh, the passage of immigration form in the Senate. So we need it, get behind it. That's the big number one for me. Number two, tax package. Um, things are adding up, aren't they? We have Senator Baucus who's announced that he's stepping down and that he desires to do a, a tax um, bill before he leaves office. Uh, yesterday, we read the Washington Post, the front page article about Apple and their tax uh, situation. Um, not the only company that's finding ways to uh, manage their finances through other country investments, but I think it's something that's going to be an irritant for people. Um, we have general budget pressure that um, is really signaling that we need to do something on the revenue side. And yes, there is that little IRS review of the Tea Party groups. So all of it adds up to me a lot of energy in this space. And I think that's great opportunities for American agriculture. Uh, farmland, estate uh, transfer is always an issue. And there may be opportunities to think more creatively there beyond what's currently um, in place to even exploring options around sweat equity arrangements where this new generation of American farmers and ranchers who largely are going to come from the non-farm sector and are facing incredible capital costs to get into American agriculture and they don't actually have the know-how that's going to allow them to su succeed because they didn't grow up on the farm. Is there a way that we can incentivize farmers to bring on this next generation. I think that there's a real opportunity there. Number three on my list is FISMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act. It is yet to be implemented, as you all know. I think it has the um, potential to transform, disrupt, improve, and potentially destroy some operations. Now, USDA has worked really hard to bolster um, FDA's efforts by seconding staff to the folk who are working on development of those regulations. Uh, we've certainly spent a lot of hours reviewing the various drafts of their regulations. I remember one Wednesday before Thanksgiving Thursday spending the whole afternoon with Mike Taylor in our conference room. So there's been a lot of back and forth. Um, but it's, it's big. It's really big. And it could change. Uh, change agriculture, particularly in certain uh, parts of our industry, more than you might imagine. My, my view has always been no one gets a pass on food safety. <coughs> Everyone has to achieve the highest levels of food safety. Of course, that's a no-brainer. But sometimes I worry that our bureaucracies, and I'm not just saying FDA, I'm also saying FSIS, um, they're not always as creative as they might be in finding different pathways to achieve that same level of food safety. I'm very, maybe overly aware, some might argue, of the struggles of small and mid-sized operations in terms of trying to comply with regulations that have no sensitivity to size differential. And so as we watch the implementation of this, I think we're going to see a lot of um, starts and false starts, and it's, it's going to take a while. If I had a magic wand, and no one's given me one yet in my life, I would try to rethink the way we are doing that, um, that rulemaking by putting the riskier crops first and foremost. I mean, we all know that there are certain crops like sprouts <laughs> where we have plenty of data that show that they're of higher risk than, than others. And yet, there's still a very much uh, 
everyone's treated the same aspect of the statue in the rulemaking. And ideally, we would do something a little bit different. But FISMA, it's a game changer. Number four, trade agreements. As you all know, the administration is focused on two big deals. Um, first is with Europe. Uh, I just saw that yesterday uh, Miriam Sapiro has been announced as the acting trade rep. She has been the person on the Europe uh, desk, so to speak, over the first term. She's great. She's a college friend, actually, full disclosure. And uh, Mike Froman, when he is uh, confirmed, he's going to do a great job. So we've got a great team there. But uh, Europe's going to be tough. How valuable if we could do it? In uh, February 2012, I had the joy of going to Nuremberg, Germany and signing the equivalency arrangement uh, with the EU on organic agriculture. And, oh, wow, it's just so meaningful um, for the organic industry here in this country. It meant streamlining. It meant no duplicate uh, duplicative inspections, no duplicative fees, uh, just uh, really made a huge difference in people's ability to trade. And I have, since that time, heard from so many people in the industry, their personal stories, their company stories about how that just really skyrocketed their profits and their opportunities. So I understand um, the value if we could pull that off. But I also know that it's going to be very difficult. I don't know how many of you noticed that in the very first week of May, uh, USDA and EPA put out a report on, on honeybee health and the issue around colony decline. It was something that I really wanted to make sure happened in my final days at USDA because it was something that Deputy Bob Purchasepi and I, the deputy over at EPA, worked on very closely and it involved a lot of stakeholders and a lot of work. Um, interestingly, that very same week, um, the, in Europe they decided that uh, the cause for um, colony decline was pesticides and they're moving to a two-year ban on a certain class of pesticides. In the U.S., we said, you know, pesticides surely play a role but it's a lot more complicated than that. It probably also is about uh, nutrition and parasites and diseases and genetics. And, and it, 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 it's, 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 you know, it's something that we're going to have to do a lot of work on. So there's different approaches, different ways of thinking that says to me that that's going to be an uphill climb. But again, it is, uh, it is worth it if we can do it. Of course, we also have the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, within REACH. And the Economic Research Service at USDA put out an interesting report in April that really described, I recommend it, the potential uh, impact that TPP would have on the horticultural industry in this country, where, particularly if Japan joins in, um, we would have huge new market opportunities for certain fruits and vegetables, nuts, um, where right now we don't have an even playing field with competitors that have preferential access. So trade deals, that was my number four. Number five, fruits and vegetables in the diet in the marketplace. So I know a lot of my career has been about the fruit and vegetable industry. Bob Schramm sitting right in front of me. I did spend a little time in his office. He schooled me. Um, so. Uh, it's all exciting right now because I think we're moving in the right direction in terms of fruits and vegetables. The My Plate icon that captures the last iteration of the dietary guidelines is sleek. It's cool. It's very simple and understandable and the message there is half a plate, half a plate of fruits and vegetables. And I think that we're starting to see some changes in the American American diet, and um, we've seen some dropping off on the skyrocketing obesity rates, finally. And I'll credit a lot of that to our First Lady, who's taken on one of the most intractable, tough 
policy issues of our era and made it her signature issue. And she's done a terrific job dancing across this country saying, let's move. But since 1994, I want to throw this statistic out. We have seen an increase in imports uh, of fruits and vegetables, including, what, I mean, there's certainly some that we don't grow and that there's seasonality issues, but we're even seeing an increase in fruits and vegetables that we grow in season during that time period. Uh, I could give you lots of numbers. Last year, imports made up 44% of domestic fruit and nut use and 19% of vegetables. Our chief economist's office at USDA R, I mean R because we're taxpayers, but you know, my lingo, I need to adjust my language. I no longer work there. I'm a recovering ex-deputy secretary. I do realize that. Um, but our chief economist's office projects that by 2022, those uh, projections will be 52% of domestic fruit and nut use and 24% of vegetable use. To me, this is suggesting that we're leaving opportunity on the table for American farmers. There's going to be growth in fruit and vegetable demand domestically. And if we get TPP, lots of opportunity for export markets. And it seems to me, particularly for this new generation of farmers that we need to bring on the scene, doing the local, regional fruit and vegetable gig really makes sense. It allows them a high value crop on small acreage as they get a foothold into the industry. Some of them will scale up, but some will stay in that market for the rest of their careers. I think it's really, really very exciting. That's my number five. Number six, decreasing federal budgets. Well, if you've ever visited my office during the time I was deputy secretary, you'll know that I'm a very frugal person. I know that the political animal's instinct when they get into one of these jobs is to redecorate their office. Instead, I directed my staff to go to the warehouse of used office furniture that the federal government has. And we found eight matching chairs. We spent $25 a piece to have them cleaned. Um, and they were in my office uh, that way for three years. But after one meeting, when I found out a man for 90 minutes was sitting in a chair and the bottom had completely gone out, but he didn't want to say anything, we did have them recovered. But, but, but generally, um, I took my job as the deputy secretary COO overseeing the budget rule very, very seriously because these are tough times and was very cognizant that American families were tightening their belts the economy wasn't doing so well, and that we really needed to marshal federal resources in a better way. So you know the stats. USDA is a $150 billion organization. During the time that I was um, at USDA, we cut 15% of our budget. And that is a really different experience than when I was the AMS administrator at the tail end of Clinton, where working with Congress, we doubled our appropriations for the agency. So I've been on both sides. Um, cutting is tough, but I want you to know that Tom Vilsack and I really um, have been fearless, I would like to say, in examining and challenging and shedding certain uh, budget items. Is there more to cut? There's always more to cut. I love the SAVE award thing that the president does where different anyone in the rank and file can nominate uh, action of government to save the taxpayer dollars. We had one of the top three finalists at USDA a couple years ago, and it was a food safety inspection service worker who said, okay, we send these lab samples to wherever they have to go by a FedEx box because time is of essence. But then the container that's sent back to us is also sent via FedEx, and it could go parcel post. And, you know, Ultimately, that was a savings of, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. And you're saying, out of a $150 billion budget? Yeah, but those kind of initiatives add up. And I think that there's always those kind of savings that can be made. Um, we're really working on, the USDA is really working on the WIC program and trying to tighten it up, um, particularly in California, how some of that plays out at retail, which could make a lot of difference. Farm Service Agency, Risk Management Agency, there are issues around improper payments that are being tackled. So there's definitely 
money that be, can be squeezed out of the bureaucracy. That said, there are a couple of distressing realities. First is that there are certain discretionary accounts that keep growing and continually put pressure on your other accounts. The WIC programs, the largest USDA discretionary account. Um, fire suppression, <laughs> you got to battle the fires. You can't control the fires. I mean, you certainly can do uh, work to prevent um, the situations from being um, very uh, advantageous for fire, but there's, no, there's a lot you can't do. And rental assistance. We provide rental assistance for a lot of uh, um, low-income people around the country. You can't throw them out of their houses. Uh, so that, that's tough. And then we also have the public perception, the public perception of how USDA uses their money. I'm addicted to Veep, Julie Dreyfus. I love that show. And maybe because, you know, as a deputy, I always say you walk in the office, has a secretary called, has a president called, and they all chuckle. And if you watch that show, she always comes into her office, has a president called. No, ma'am, he hasn't called. Uh, anyhow, in the episode this past week, when she's cutting some deal on legislation, ag subsidies came up. Of course ag subsidies comes up. Always comes up, right? I, over the course of my time as deputy, visited something like 34, 35 colleges from, you know, the hardcore land-grant Iowa states to the elite four years like Stanford to the Greenfield Community Colleges, all shapes and sizes of universities. And I use eye clickers. These are things where kids in the audience can vote and I'd ask them questions, sort of elicit what they're thinking and, and have education through that. If you've um, never seen these, it's sort of like, um, are you smarter than a fifth grader? And they ask the audience. That's what we were doing. And so I would say, what is, you know, what is the most USDA dollars spent on? Nutrition assistance, food safety, conservation, research, farm subsidies. And what was the answer? Farm subsidies. farm subsidies. Across the board, always farm subsidies. And then I would show them the pie chart that showed that, you know, somewhere depending upon the year, somewhere between 72 and 74 percent of USDA dollars are actually going to nutrition assistance. And you could just feel the confusion in the room. So this whole idea that all of USDA is about ag subsidies is so disproportionate to the reality that it can't help but hit us when we're talking about the future of the department's budget. That was number six. Number seven, certainty. Certainty. Well, hopefully you've heard about this, and it dovetails in with my conversation about budget pressures because the more that we have budget pressures, the more you see both Congress and the administration chimping our mandatory programs, meaning cutting back in the mandatory dollars to provide more breathing room in our discretionary accounts. Certainty is one of the things when I was uh, at USDA that I am most proud of. What is certainty? Um, so Bob Perciusepi, who's a good friend, and he is the deputy at EPA and uh, a graduate of Cornell University in agronomy. So he does know ag. Uh, he and I went out to California on a trip to look at a whole variety of ag stuff together uh, to signal to the world that EPA and USDA do work together and we do talk. And um, what started basically on a cocktail napkin, <laughs> yes, there were margaritas there too, um, ended up in uh, December of 2011 letters to commissioners of agriculture in the Chesapeake Bay area suggesting this concept that if you are engaged in state-of-the-art conservation such as supported by the Natural Resources Conservation Service of USDA, you should have some certainty that you're not going to be regulated out of business. So right, EPA has the Clean Water Act. They are putting pressure necessarily on states about TMDLs. How are we going to deal with this? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we protect farmers? Because uh, Bob and I, I shouldn't speak for him, he's not here, but certainly I've always felt that keeping farms in the world is the best thing for the environment. If farming's done well, I'd certainly put a farm up against 
urban storm drain runoff any day. It hails back to a conference I was involved in when I worked for the Henry Wallace Institute for Alternative Agriculture, uh, and we did it in collaboration with Tufts University, where I eventually found my academic world. Uh, back in the mid-1990s, we had a conference called uh, Environmental Enhancement Through Agriculture. Not environment versus agriculture, but environmental enhancement through agriculture. And I still believe that can be the case. So in terms of certainty, we've gone beyond the Chesapeake Bay, but that concept, I hope, will be nurtured and will really take off. That could make a huge difference. Number eight, ecosystem markets. Yes, I certainly did read about the collapse of the climate exchange in Europe uh, that was reported recently, but I think there's so much good energy and work going on in the intellectual framework for ecosystem markets and that it makes so much sense that between those two things, I can't but help to believe that it will happen sooner or later. Um, farmers provide a public good, and the concept of green payments in some ways first embodied in that original CSP uh, some farm bills ago, um, that they should be rewarded uh, makes some sense, and here would be a way through a private market function. Now, how do we measure and value these kinds of contributions? That's one of the most intriguing issues of today, but it's something that I'm not going to keep my eye off of. Number nine, GMO labeling. Now I thought about where to put this in the list, and I said, how about number nine, because some people are gonna be drifting off in their thoughts now. <laughs> so hello. Um, so there's a lot happening, isn't there, on this. The next battleground state seems to be shaping up to be Washington, but my expect expectation is this is sort of a whack-a-mole problem. Um, people want to know. I'm not saying it's right to know or need to know, but they want to know. And I don't think this is going to go away. So my question here today for you, and I think this is worth some thought from all of us, is what is the relationship to organic? So FDA and USDA have not allowed to date an organic label um, an organic producer to put on a GMO-free claim. By the way, I'm saying GMO. I'm not going to get in that debate. You say GE, GMO, and what does that mean? I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so the National Organic Program requires um, that producers demonstrate through certification by accredited certifying agents that there is not a GMO involvement in the production of that food. So when I look at USDA, I got one side of the house saying this is a GMO free claim, and the other side of the house saying, oh, but you can't say that. It's schizophrenic, right? So I think back to 2000, and many of you remember our colleague Linda Fisher, uh, who was working for Monsanto at the time as a, as a EPA survivor. And um, she uh, was the point person on submitting Monsanto's comments to the second proposed rule for the National Organic Program. The first proposed rule, you may remember, was overwhelmingly uh, denounced, record-breaking comments from the public about what they thought organic should be, and a big part of that was no GMO, okay? So Monsanto took a look at that, and they sent in comments saying, we concur. Organic should be no GMO. And I think the thought process at the time, the logic for Monsanto was, for the people who want to know, they have an option. So I don't know if that logic still reigns, but it seems to me that if it does, um, I'm curious why the industry isn't pressing the federal government to allow for that organic plus GMO free claim. Number 10, the aging of the American farmer and the transition that's going on in our working lands. 
So you know the stat, right? For every farmer under the age of 35, we have six over the age of 65. The average age is nearing 60 years of age, and we'll know a lot more when we get the completion of the 2012 Census of Agriculture. I'm looking forward to that. Um, this is huge. And when I go around the countryside, I've met dairy farmers in their 80s, still farming. That's a tough life. Not because they still want to be farming, but because they haven't figured out how to transition their operation. I've met a lot of young people who are really excited about getting their hands in the soil, being part of American agriculture, but you know, they didn't grow up on the farm or the ranch. And in some cases, I think they're over their heads in what they're trying to take on. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen to make this transition occur and occur well. And it's something that I think should be front and center for all of us in our work. By the way, Economic Research Service came out with a very interesting report, also the first week in May. And it was about women principal farm operators in this country, how there's huge growth. We saw that in the 20, 2007 census, but also in the census before, it's been an upward trend. And right now, by, um, by our count through the census, there are a million women farmers in this country. So things have certainly changed also on the gender front. We know a lot of the young people are interested in alternative production methods. Anyhow, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that we need to deal with. And, and if I could just sort of expand this briefly, saying that our continual challenge is to make the connection with the American public about the relevancy of American agriculture. On that college tour I mentioned to you where I asked about the USDA budget, I also asked the question about how long does a chicken live before it's your dinner? And you'd be amazed how many people say two years. <laughs> so there is, there's a lot that we need to talk about. And I just want to conclude by saying that I really appreciate the conference organizers for providing this forum, a forum for diverse viewpoints um, that lead to great discussions. And I think that's just what we all need. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, maybe we'll say we'll limit it to two to inspire you to jump up. So yes. Let me get you the microphone here. Uh, Gary Blumenthal, War Perspectives. Um, Kathleen, first, I got to tell you that uh, the number one question I got after your resignation was, why? So <laughs> that's one question. But uh, in terms of uh, the right to know, I think uh, most consumers do not understand that actually chemicals are used in the production of organic crops. They just happen to be the chemicals that are approved by the National Organic Board. So the question to you is, do consumers have a right to know what chemicals are used and be labeled on organic products. They could find that on our website, or USDA's website, USDA.gov, go to the National Organic Program, and all the approved materials for organic production is on that list. So it's fairly transparent, and there's a very involved process with um, public notice of National Organic Standards Board's meeting. I'm a five-year uh, survivor of that board, where all of those things are um, debated in public. There's public comment taken. And only after the NOSB recommends a material to be put on the national list uh, does the secretary then proceed with public rulemaking through the Federal Register. So I, Gary, would argue it's a very transparent process. Now, why did I leave USDA? Have you noticed there's a mass exodus of deputies across the federal government? I might have been one of the first to announce my departure, but it's a very, very big club. I do believe that deputy secretary jobs are perhaps the hardest in the federal government. There's a lot of pressure there. So one of us should be surprised that some of us want to come up for fresh air. But maybe even more importantly, I'm really looking forward to people calling me Kathleen again, not deputy. And I thought, well, you know, was it because I'm just not a formal person? That's true. But then it really, like, what when you hear deputy, what does everyone think of? It's Barney Fife. 
Honest to God. I, I Googled images. I put my name in, Kathleen Merrigan, in Google Images. Like, it's nearly 4,000 images. I mean, some random stuff comes up, too. And believe me, I've had more hairdos than Hillary Clinton, apparently. But, um, but, but Barney Fife, it's like, like 50,000 images. I mean, he's still the number one known deputy. And maybe that's a good reason to step down, too. I don't know. Another question? Yes. Hi, Jean Restino. I'm a Jefferson Science Fellow at USAID and a plant pathologist at NC State. And I was interested in your comments on the WIC program and 70 some percent of the USAID budget going into WIC. And then also listening to your comments on the growth of younger women in farming. And I'm thinking, is there a way to link these WIC vouchers to CSAs for local farmers and communities to connect people that need food with young folks that are producing food, so it will be farm subsidies for small local organic farms in communities around urban areas where there's a need for food and not a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, that's an action-packed question. Um, so first let me clarify the um, nutrition assistance that USDA is engaged in is more than the WIC program. The WIC is the largest discretionary program, but the, the big mother load of money goes through the SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps. Um, and of course, that is the major um, bone of contention between the House and the Senate right now is how many, how deeply are we going to cut in, uh, in SNAP benefits um, because that is such a big dollar amount. It also includes your school meals, your subsidies for school lunches, for example, school breakfast, TFAP, um, a, a whole variety of things, so broadly put. Um, are there things that we can do to make those connections? Well, we have a SNAP Ed program, which is about $400 million a year, and I think there's some work going on now to uh, be more creative with that. There's been a lot of effort through electronic benefit transfer arrangements uh, at farmers markets so that people who receive WIC and SNAP and senior market coupons can go to those farmers markets and redeem those benefits. And that's been highly supported by the philanthropic community that in many cases has doubled the values of those benefits when people go to the farmers markets as a strategy to increase consumption of fruits and vegetables for overall health. So a lot of interesting stuff going on. I would recommend uh, uh, looking at the Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food website um, within USDA's broader website for more information. So. 